What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's very own Dynasty show. My name is Noah, and as always on these videos on Wednesday, I'm joined by my man Mike, at MikeMeUp on Twitter. Mike, it has been a very long time since anything football-related has happened. I am, like, this close to just passing away at this point, but the draft is right <laughs> around the corner, so I'm just trying to hang on by every tooth and nail I can. How are you feeling right now? Are you, are you in the same draft that I'm in, or are you just staying hopeful? Dude, I'm in the exact same place as you. I'm like on Twitter, like searching through all these guys, like pro days. It looked like they were filmed on camcorders from like fucking 10 years ago, and everyone's running like a 4 3. Is that George <laughs> Titan, like excited. Wolf ran like a 4 4 2, <laughs> yeah. like 250 pounds? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If that guy runs a 4 2, then I run a 4 5. So, uh, but yeah, that. we're just trying to basically grasp onto every little piece of information we can. But we got to flay the public league. I'm fucking pumped. It's been a great time. A lot of legends in that league. Uh, so, you know, we're going to walk through some of that today. But, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. I'm in, like, three startups right now. Yeah, I just keep adding startups, and then I'm realizing that next year this time, my bank account is not going to be very happy with me for doing <laughs> this. But, thankfully, I have my man Yannick kind of pitching in, basically all of it. But uh, sure, daddy. <laughs> basically, but, you know, we run the team together. We make some big trades, which we'll be talking about today. This whole video is kind of like an extension of last week, whereas last week we were talking about, you know, our top 12 rookies and how – tiers may extend past the top 12 into the second round this is mostly looking at the th- uh, we'll start off with the top 10 startup players in my personal opinion michael pitch in there then we'll be talking about draft strategy as a whole why it's important to maybe trade out of the first round or if there's value there's reason to trade into the first round we have a few trades breaking that down uh, and then breaking down trades that actually wouldn't happen in the fillet the public league a very high stakes league at least for me you know a 500 hundred dollar buy-in is pretty hefty and people are taking it very seriously and we're putting out trades and People are accepting accepting them. So we're going to break those down and see different moves you guys can make in your own leagues if you're starting right now or you're already in a league. Maybe some different players you can package for high-end names. So without further ado, I think it's time to hit the intro. So first up, I have a tier of four, and you'll see it on the screen right now. It's basically the top two running backs and the top two quarterbacks in Dynasty by consensus. It's McCaffrey, Saquon, Mahomes, and Lamar Jackson. Typically, I will go in that order with the running backs first and then the quarterbacks after just because there's such a big drop-off between those top two running backs. Like, Even though Kamara, Elliott, uh, Dalvin Cook are very good running backs, I would much rather have, have CMC and Saquon and give up having Dalvin Cook and Michael Thomas than picking Mahomes and being stuck with you know, uh, a Joe Mixon or Nick Chubb. I just think that their pass catching ability and what they can do on the ground as well as their age is going to make them much better fantasy assets. It's very similar to in the rookie draft, the top two running backs and the top four and the top two quarterbacks making that top four with two smaller tiers within it. And Mike, I'm pretty sure you're in the same boat choosing McCaffrey and Saquon one and two, right? Yeah. Hell yeah, man. I mean, I think it just, all, people always like to go to the longevity argument, right? And I get it. Like quarterbacks last longer and you, they last you a decade, but I'm, I'm always like chasing the apex and like, there's just like no bigger advantage than CMC in my opinion. Uh, because like, even though Mahomes and Jacks are freaking cheat codes as well, the like Delta between them and like a Ryan Tannehill versus like a CMC versus like, I don't know. I don't know. Someone like Todd Gurley is like, a, is a lot bigger. So that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. hundred percent. And then, yeah, you do bring it up. Like Lamar Jackson may have that Konami code, but so does McCaffrey. How many running backs are going out there and catching 115 balls a season? McCaffrey mm-hmm. has that upside. Sure, nobody runs like Lamar does, but a lot of guys pass and make up for that disparity in rushing ability that Lamar has. So that rounds out my top four. For what I would give up for each one of these guys, I put together like four different types of packages, but I'd be willing to give up the same thing. So if you're sending, if you're at the 101 or at the 104, I'd probably be looking for a very similar return. So some scenarios that I have would be trade the 101 for a second, a third, and a sixth. And you may be saying, oh, a sixth in there? What are you doing with that? But when you really break it up and you look at the players available, I'm just going through the fillet, the public, what happened in the mid rounds. I'm not going by ADP. I'm going by what actually happened like as early or as recent as a week ago with those two, three and six picks, you can get a Nick Chubb uh, an Amari Cooper and a Calvin Ridley for Christian McCaffrey. And when you put names to that, I think a hundred times out of a hundred, you're taking the Chubb side because even just Chubb and Cooper, that is extremely close for Christian McCaffrey. Then you add a guy like Ridley, who's what, 24, 25 years old, high-powered offense, no more Hooper. He's going to eat this year. I think that's a huge value. Mike, what do you think about that trade that I just brought up, like a 2-3-6 for the 101? It might not sound great, yeah. but when you put names. That, 
that's money, man. I mean, if you can get if you can get a second and third for like a first, it's really good. Granted, this is CMC, so I think getting that like six round pick on top of it is a premium. And like what people don't realize is like value will always fall to you. Like you, you just like when you're sitting on the clock, you're like, oh man, like this guy's not gonna fall to me. This guy's not gonna fall to me. But like everyone ranks stuff differently. Like even though we have the BDG guide out, right? If you're just following our rankings, like, I mean, why are you even playing fantasy football? Don't do it. Like, <laughs> we don't even follow our own rankings. rankings. Yeah, like I, I like I have rankings, but I adjust and tailor my stuff to the feel of the draft, like every single league. Like I'll I'll never take guys in the same spot. I just like to see what other people are doing and adjust accordingly. So like always try and like it hurts to give it up because you're like, damn, I'm giving up like a top asset. But like when you're sitting there in the fifth and sixth round and you have like two picks or three picks you're going to be sitting a lot prettier. So I really, I really love that trade. I think a two, three and six is a, is a monster return. I would even take like a three, like a three, four, like a three, four, five, I think yep. would be, would be money too. That's what, that's what that's I have up next for Saquon Barkley. A three, four, five could then net you a Baker Mayfield, a Cortland Sutton, Allen Robinson. Sure. You're not yeah. getting a running back back, but if you trade your one Oh two, then what you have the two eleven. you can grab a guy like a Miles Sanders there, maybe mm-hmm. even like a Deandre Swift. And then you add on top of that Baker Sutton and a Rob, that is a huge return. That is money. You get a fringe QB1 and two basically very close to top 12 wide receivers for dynasty purposes, at least in my eyes. So, yeah. And another thing I'll say, Mike, you said value falls. If you are in a startup draft and you are including rookie picks like we did in the Filet of the Public League, the thing that I notice is so much value falls because rookie picks are so hyped, especially in the later rounds when it's guys like, let's see who's on the board, like a Chris Carson, a Mark Ingram, uh, a Damian Williams. People at that point just want to take shots at rookie picks. So then in rounds like 9, 10, 11, you're getting extremely, extremely valuable players. We'll get it into it a little bit more when we look at the board. But guys like Daryl Henderson, even going into the 10th round, sure, he might not mm-hmm. be the starting running back there, but it's a very good shot to take. So there is a ton of value that falls when you include rookie picks in these drafts. So definitely do not undervalue trading back out of the first round because you know a ton of these really, really good players – are going to be values. Um, yeah. And then rookie one- picks, rookie picks. Sorry about that. Got cut off for a second on video. Um, so I was just saying like, you know, you like super flex is what really pushes like talent down the board. Cause in a normal QB league, like most guys aren't drafting. I mean, if you're smart, you're not drafting quarterbacks until the late single digits, but in super flex, you're going to get about, you know, anywhere between one to one and a half full rounds of quarterbacks that are drafted within the first one to four rounds so that normally you'd be getting someone in the fourth round you're now seeing them drop to the sixth round so and then on top of that we have like tight end premium so that also pushes some of the tight ends up so just all these factors come into play uh when you're thinking about like what round you're getting back so even though like something like six sounds really late when you get to the sixth round there's a lot of good players left yeah that's why in the discord i think the the standard settings that I had put in were tight end premium and super flex, not because I think it's superior. Like I would much rather play in a super flex league, tight end premium. I'm whatever about, but like, I just think having a super flex and tight end premium league makes the startup draft so much more fun because there's so much different Mm -hmm. strategies that goes into it. You get a ton of really good players at value because of that. So as Mike was saying, right, you see a bunch of guys fall on the board. You're able to make trades that when you just put numbers to it, instead of names, you might not think you're getting a good return, whether it's like a two, four and six for the number one overall pick. You might not think is great, but because of these different settings and the different leagues that you are in, you might be able to get like an A.J. Brown in the fourth round, whereas in a one quarterback league, he might be a late second round pick. So, yeah, it makes it a ton different drafting. And that's why you can join different mock drafts through our Discord channel. We'll plug that right now. Uh, the Mock Draft Central, we have Discord. We have mock drafts running basically every single second of the day. You can put in your own different type of formats to see the value fall. You obviously can't trade in those leagues, which is what this episode is kind of centered around. But you can see if you were to trade what positions you might want to move for. And you might realize that, you know, a second round pick for a fourth, fifth and seventh is actually a really good value. So moving on from that, we move to at least my next tier. And it's a bunch of it's a bunch of guys. It's five people. It is Alvin Kamara, Dalvin Cook, Michael Thomas, Ezekiel Elliott and Kyler Murray. And Kyler Murray, I snuck in here. And then when I realized when I was putting names to these numbers, what I would trade Kyler Murray to get in return, I wanted more than the rest of these guys in this tier. And that's because it's super flex, right? And when I put, I put him down for a second and a fourth, I would want in return. And that's a Wilson and Mike Evans. Whereas the other guys, I put like three, five, six. But when you get to the third round, the quarterbacks, the difference between like a Kyler Murray and like a Daniel Jones or a Jared Goff is just so huge that 
you know, if you are in the lottery for Kyler Murray, if you want to get him on your team, I would try to at least net you a second or third round pick so you can get a guy like a Russell Wilson or Josh Allen in return. And Mike, I see you have Kyler Murray in the next tier of yours. So why don't you touch on a bit why you have MT and then the three running backs in a tier above those guys? Yeah, I mean, I love Kyler, but uh, I think just, again, you know, there's still like some risk involved there. And I personally just don't really like taking quarterbacks in the first round period because there's like so much more replaceability later on. So I think when it comes down to it for me, it's like, you know, I would much rather if, if I'm sitting on like how I think about tiers is like, would I really trade off any of these guys for one another, right? Like if I'm actually sitting there at the 105 to 108, which we'll have it here, like would I actually ever take Kyler over Cook, Kamara, MT Zeke? I would not. Um, so that's kind of how I think about the tier break. So I'd be willing to take less for him than I would be for some of those other guys. And it's just a matter of preference, right? And I think like Kyler's already like, he's seen like a pretty meteoric rise over the last, I don't know, call it a couple months where, you know, I understand the whole new Hopkins getting there is, is a good thing for him, but I'm not sure like, you know, it's like that good to warrant that much of a jump. Like I still really love Watson. I still really love Dak who I have like at the same tier as him. So I'd rather just, you know, maybe trade back and, you know, land one of those guys later yeah I forgot where I saw this but like what is more likely right Kyler Murray has a very similar season to Baker Mayfield next year or all of a sudden he becomes the next Lamar Jackson I think when you put it that way it's more likely he becomes a Baker Mayfield he has maybe a little bit of struggles with a new face in town obviously he's not as much of an off-field or character problem as Odell like I don't really know the guy personally but at least that's what's being said about the guy so and obviously with this coronavirus stuff, like maybe they don't get to implement him fully into their offense. So maybe he takes a step back and this isn't the time to buy in Kyler Murray. You wait a little bit and then you try to get him at a value like you could with Baker Mayfield recently. So yeah, I kind of agree with you. That's why I have him at the bottom. But when I'm trying to trade for those picks, it was really hard for me to not, you know, bump up the package I want in return. Uh, as for the other guys, Alvin Kamara, Dalvin Cook, MT and Zeke, something like a three, five, six, uh, a second and a fourth, a two, five, seven, like a two, five, seven can net you chubb waller michael gallup like michael gallup in the seventh round is money even like a two and a seven right alvin kamara for nick chubb and michael gallup i don't know if i would say no to that package yeah no that's definitely true like i would almost rather like you have a couple where it's like one for two picks i would almost rather like just get a later pick but three picks back you know so like instead of a two or four i would much rather have a three five six um mm -hmm. personally so like yeah. and it sounds bad because you're totally moving out of the top 24 players but like those three picks are just so valuable and we'll, we'll like get into like what that means for you later on. But it's just like, I would rather have three picks. I always want to try and accumulate as many picks as I can in those like mid to mid low single digit rounds. That's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. And I feel like depth sometimes is super underrated, right? You're in dynasty and you know, you're probably going to trade these guys a ton, but you want these guys for the long haul. And if a guy gets hurt one year and you have no depth to show for it, it's like the same thing in redraft leagues, but you know, the waiver wire is more plentiful than it is in a dynasty league. But if you're just going for a super top heavy roster and a guy like Devonte Adams who last year got hurt. And I know Mike, you went through these pains and troubles, but if a guy like that gets hurt and you're throwing in like Andy Isabella, hopefully he gets you two and a half points on a week. You're probably not winning that year. And that's just another year out of your top guys prime that you're not contending. And if you can trade a Mike or Michael Thomas, which Mike did, and we'll get into it later, but I have him at the one Oh seven. If you could trade that pick for a three, five, six and get Amari, a Robin Ridley, even a three, five, or even just a three, six and getting two of those guys, I think that's a huge win because you get basically a wide receiver one and two wide receiver twos for what is probably the number one wide receiver and fantasy football, but you get the depth along with it. You can be flexible with your bye weeks. You can add them to your flex if you're in a deep starting roster type of league. So yeah, trading mm -hmm. back is in my opinion, almost always the move, but there will be value for you sometimes by moving ahead. Yeah. I will say though, like I've, I, ever since I tweeted out my thread of me trading back in the DLF champions league, uh, I've seen like some people like trade some stuff back and some people take it like way too far. Like you got to trade back at like value, right? Like, you, you can, I see people are trading like their first round pick and like, uh, and they're like, you know, fifth round pick for like the other guy's second round pick and a fourth round pick. Like that's just not worth it at that point because all you're doing is trading out of a very elite tier to like get some bump in like the fourth to fifth rounds, which I don't even think there's many tier breaks there, to be honest with you. So like, don't just trade back for the sake of trading back. Like you got to actually trade back and get value. And, and if everyone in your league is trying to trade back, so there's more sellers and buyers, sometimes you just trade up. Like, you know what I mean? You start like go against the grain and just zig another zag. Yeah. That's why I mean by like, I never go into a draft being like, I'm always going to do X, Y, Z. I'm just going to like try and feel it out, see what people are doing. And then, you know, take things that way. Yeah, you always have to be flexible in Dynasty League. Like, you can go into to it thinking, like, oh, I want to build a young roster. 
and then Julio Jones falls to you in the, like the seventh round because nobody wants him. Like, you can't just build a young roster. You can compete now because you're getting a top five wide receiver for the next two or three years at a huge discount. So I completely agree with you. And Yannick and I actually made a crazy trade. It didn't look crazy when it happened, but we'll get into it later that we traded back and then we traded up to get the same thing and more on top, which was, <laughs> it was good for us at least. It's totally fucking bent him over. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. To round out my top 12, uh, the tiers, I have Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, and Dak Prescott at 110, 111, and 112. Mike, yours is a little bit different. You don't have Dak in your top 12, but you have a few running backs. So why don't you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I just have like that next tier of workhorse running backs. I got Mixon, Chubb, and I have JT in there because I kind of view Chubb and JT as almost like swappable. Mm -hmm. And like, again, it's just for me, it's like I'm trying to build out, I'm trying to think about roster construction because like when you think about value normally and like when you look at our ranks, like you can use that in the context of like trading and stuff like that, but it doesn't really take into context like roster construction. Like when I think about going into the draft, it's like if I take wide receivers at the top, what does my rest of my draft look like versus if I take a JT Chubb Mixon, what does the draft my dra rest of my draft look like? So that's kind of how I think about my tiers. And um, yeah, I just, I love Mixon. I love Chubb and I love JT, but they're definitely one tier below that like second tier running back for me. Yeah. And like you just said, right. Wide receivers fall so far. A package that I have for Dak Prescott would be like a mid to late second and an eighth. Somebody will just throw in an eighth and be like, Oh, I'm not going to get anything there. In our league, a mid to late second, Mike, you actually got Watson pretty late. I would say in most leagues that isn't going to happen. Yeah. Maybe a Russell Wilson or a Josh Allen. You get a Josh Allen, and in the eighth round, you get Tyler Lockett for Dak Prescott. The disparity in quarterback play does not make up for just getting a free Tyler Lockett in the deal, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally agree. And, like, Watson has been falling way too far. Like, I got him at the 2.08 in our league. I actually have him ranked in the first round because I don't, I don't actually buy into the fact that he sucks now without D-Hop. But, uh, yeah, if he, like, I actually got him late, but normally you wouldn't be able to pull off a deal like that. So a locket isn't really, you know. Yeah, and it's not like Deshaun Watson lost his legs, right? And he just got the best <laughs> receiver in football, Brandon Cook. So I think he's, yeah. I think he's actually in a better situation now. So yeah. uh, just 50-yard bombs all day. But that's it for our top 12 guys. Now we're going to jump into – or we're going to talk about draft strategy, and then we'll talk into some trades. So just high-level – you know, trading back, trading forward, what you do with wide receivers. And Mike, I think one of your biggest points that you've pushed throughout videos is you don't want to take wide receivers early because they fall super far. Now, is that something you do in all drafts or do you sometimes see yourself in a mid second round? If a Devonte Adams falls, you're going to reach for him or you just, you stay true to your, your belief because in our draft, obviously you're going to take Deshaun Watson over a DeAndre Hopkins, but that option was available for you on the board. So at what point do you start to take wide receivers early if they do fall further than what you may have thought going into it? Yeah, honestly, man, I just, I mean, I'm in like three or four drafts right now, I think three or four startups. And I have yet to take a wide receiver in the first four rounds once, like not one time. And I think it's just like, what time, what, what point would I take it? If Tyreek kills there in the third, I'm going to take <laughs> it, right? But that doesn't happen. You know, if, if, if they're just like falling like a few spots, like Devontae Adams, ADP should be in the first round. If he falls like the mid second, I don't really care to be honest with you. That's not where I'm going to take him. If he falls like a full round or like one and a half rounds, like like you said, if Julio Jones falls like the seventh eighth rounds, like as I've seen, I would consider him there. But like I'm just I'm just not going to take wide receivers because the the important concept here is like <clears throat> anything from wide receiver like basically I'd call it ten to like wide receiver thirty. You're looking at like one point per game. That that's the scoring differential, and and you're looking at like three four five rounds of scoring differential right like i'm totally happy taking a calvin ridley in like the mid rounds like uh even a terry mclaurin like michael gallup i will happily build my roster around these types of wide receivers and stack the more resource uh constrained uh, assets at the top so you know in this league it's like quarterbacks or running backs or tight ends so that's kind of how i build i don't really deviate that from that that much unless it's like super super great value yeah, at first, I when I first started playing Dynasty, I didn't really see it that way. I just wanted all the value I could get. So like a Devontae Adams in mid-second, I'm pushing the button every single time. I'm kind of playing how you play now, like trying to wait on wide receivers. Now in this league, we did go early, but I'm not blaming Yannick at all. I do love Chris Godwin, especially in a PPR league. That's his guy. So we had a reach on him at the 201. It's not even that much of a reach. It's not even a reach. Really. Yeah, a good value. You're getting a, what, 23, 24-year-old receiver in a high-powered offense that was just a wide receiver one, despite missing a yeah. few games. So. Uh, we, we've got him, but then we decided to just wait a long time for wide receiver because there's so much value. We got Stephon Diggs at, what, the 604, which we also had Josh Allen, so we got that stack. Hopefully that stack works out in his first year <laughs> in Buffalo because if it doesn't, this whole team might just go to shambles. 
But then after that, we waited a long time and we got AJ Green in the 12th. And I am by no means an AJ Green truther, but as Mike was saying, these older guys, they start to fall off the map in startups because people want, you know, these young guys that may or may not break out instead of a guy like an AJ Green or T.Y. Hilton who went back to back. And if they're healthy starting next year, like for redraft purposes, I don't see myself ranking AJ Green outside the top 24 if he goes into camp and he goes into the season fully healthy. Like you're getting somebody that can be a league winner for your dynasty league. Maybe it's only for a one year shelf life, but you're getting that to compete now in the 12th round instead of, you know, the rookie 209 or the rookie 212 or Justice Hill, who's like third string on the Baltimore Ravens. Like I'd much rather that or like a Julian Edelman in the 15th round in a PPR league, at least in my opinion, is just a huge value because most of the other guys, sure, they could one day be valuable for you. But like an Arcega white side, what are the chances he just never does anything? I would put it yeah. at like 75-25 that he just never makes your starting roster. Whereas Julian Edelman, at least this year, is going to be in flex consideration almost every single week. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. So Kenny Galladay, popular, popular name, right? Mm-hmm. What do you think the scoring differential on a points per game basis in a PPR format is between Kenny Galladay and Robert Woods? Did Robert Woods outscore him this year? Because Kenny Galladay didn't catch a bunch of passes, did he? It was just touchdowns. 15.5. They're the exact same. So if you had Robert Woods and you had Kenny Galladay, the only difference is Robert Woods missed like a game or two, but it's not like when a player misses a game, you don't start anybody. You just like leave that slot blank, right? You put someone else in there. So like as long as a wide receiver is starting like, 10 to 12 games i'm looking at points per game uh so you like we you like basically wean out the will fullers because obviously you don't want guys yeah, sean jackson games. every time we yeah. go on fantasy <laughs> he's like wide receiver four yeah, he's up yeah there too. exactly but like robert woods is going consistently in super flex drafts in the six to seventh rounds if we look at our draft board here where did he, he go he went he went seven ten where did kenny galladay go he went in the fourth 408 right so three round difference for zero scoring differential. So like that, this is why I just cannot in good conscience, like draft wide receivers early because there's guys like Robert Woods, Calvin Ridley, Tyler Boyd, Michael Gallup. Like what, what about this? What's the diff- scoring differential between Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones Jr. How many points per game? Dude, Marvin Jones is a beast. I would say maybe one and a half. Not even less than one point a game. Marvin Jones is going in like the 14th to like 16th rounds of Superflex. That's a 10 round difference. And I get it. His value is never going to increase more than Kenny Galladay. But if you get the value in other positions early and you're trying to win, like at the end of the day, buying the most points for the cheapest amount of value for your starting lineup is how you win leagues. So that's kind of why I don't draft wide receivers early. Yeah, in my opinion, I think the three best values right now in startup drafts that if you just fade the wide receiver position, which we both advocate for, is one, Devontae Parker. I know you mm-hmm. love him. And Chan Gailey there, he just peppers his wide receivers in the red zone. And sure, you could say, oh, Preston Williams is back. Guess what he did with the Jets in 2015 and 2016 with Eric Decker and Brandon Marshall? He gave each of them like 20 targets, and they ate that year. So I love Devontae Parker. He flashed last year. He's still pretty young. All things yep. considered, right? He's got like three or four years left in his prime if we're just mm-hmm. taking the average receiver. Uh, Adam Thielen, who is 29 years old, and sure, he's a bit older, but how many slot receivers do we see just produce until their early 30s, early? Like even Golden Tate last year, who is another value. Like he is older. He was coming off of a, sp- a suspension, I believe, going to his third team in like two years, and he was still in flex consideration almost every single week. Getting Thielen yep. in the 9.02 an hour league, I think is a huge value. Huge and value. what you said is Robert Woods, right? He's not even that much worse. And he's basically the same as Kenny Galladay and only like one year older. So at least in my yeah. opinion, if you're going to wait on a receiver and stack up like eighth and ninth round picks, you can build a very, very solid wide receiver core through those later rounds by trading back. Yeah. And even though those guys have very similar ADPs, if you trade back and get like two or three picks, you're actually still able to land a couple of them. So that's just like, that's kind of my go-to strategy right now. And it's, I'm really liking how my roster shape up when I go with that approach. All right. How about quarterbacks? Now, this is a very not touchy subject because it's not like emotional or anything, but like <laughs> it's a it's very hotly debated, right? Whether you need to stack up on quarterbacks in in uh, super flex leagues or if you can fade the position, let value fall and then grab one later. So, Mike, at what point? Because this is how I view it. At what point do you start to say, OK, I'm not going to reach on these quarterbacks. Everybody else is reaching on them. I'm going to just start going for talent. I'm going to go start going for value. I'm not going to reach on the quarterback 15 just because I don't have one yet. Yeah. So uh, I don't think that's a great approach because uh, what happens is like, yes, you're getting value that falls, but then what happens is you get raped in a trade for a quarterback. So you lose all the value you get anyways. So you have to somewhat react. Right. But like, 
I, you have to somewhat react. That that's that's like you have to be fluid. Like that's why I say like you always gotta like freaking Bruce Lee says, man, be water. Man. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup. It becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle. It becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot. It becomes the teapot. Now water can flow, or it can crash. Be water, my friend. And fucking be water and be fluid and read how the draft goes. If everybody's reaching, then everybody's having value fall. So you kind of want to be on a level playing ground. Like I'm not saying that I'm going to take Daniel Jones in the third round, right? But you know, if I'm sitting there in the fourth or sixth, I'm trying to decide between a value wide receiver. And like maybe a quarterback that I don't love as much, someone like a Kirk Cousins or like a Ryan Tannehill that you think should go later, I'm gonna click the buy on one of them because trying to buy them for that wide receiver after the draft is not gonna work. Yeah, Mike, if I was good at editing and I might actually be decent enough to do this, I'm gonna put a Bruce Lee picture right when you said that and just <laughs> overlay that. Hopefully that works out. <laughs> I probably won't. So if you don't see it, that's why. Um, and yeah, my approach is the opposite of yours, but I will go back and try to make a trade for a quarterback. So in this league, we went all the way till the, I think, the fifth round without actually picking a quarterback for ourselves. But we were in trade talks for a pretty long time with our man, Richie. Richie, love you, man. Uh, we'll get into the trade later. But we basically traded a fourth and a seventh for Josh Allen, which was like a second round pick and a 12th. So it ended up being a decent enough value for us. And then we grabbed Minshew in the sixth. And my quarterback strategy, it worked out in this one is try to play on the unknown, right? Because right now, not much is known about Cam Newton or Jameis Winston or like the quarterback situation in uh, New England. And I think it worked out very, very well for us because we have Josh Allen, then we went Minshew. Then the end of the ninth round, we went Cam Newton. And Cam Newton, I'm not so sure if he's been linked to the Jaguars. Hopefully not because I want Gardner Minshew to be my starting quarterback. But if he does go to the Jaguars, we have the starting quarterback there. Then we grab Jarrett Stidham, I think in the 12th round. So if he goes to the Patriots, we have the starting quarterback there. If Cam Newton doesn't end up in Jacksonville or the Patriots and he's a starting quarterback elsewhere, we have four starting quarterbacks and we have the flexibility to trade him for something else. So what I would say is if you're in a startup draft right now in the ninth, 10th round and Jameis Winston and Cam Newton are still on the board for you, just buy them. Because what are the chances that anybody else in that range is going to accrue more value from now to the start of the season than a quarterback who has proven to be a starter in the NFL for the past four or five years and when they're on the field are very, very good fantasy quarterbacks even if they're not good this year, you can just trade off of name value and get a return that would have been like a fifth or sixth round startup pick. So there's a ton of value in grabbing those guys late, even though it's a little scary right now because we don't know where they're at. But I think that's just an effect of what's happening off the field, right? People can't do their physicals and all that stuff. So that's what I like to play off of. That's the value that I like to get with the Jameis Winston and a Cam Newton. Dude, I, I totally agree. And I was so pissed you guys took Cam Newton at ninth because I thought he would fall to me in the 10th. Yannick was and, too, so don't be worried. <laughs> yeah, I was so pissed. Uh, but I, I did get Jameis Winston, so that's good. But that, that, is, that is like a concept that people really need to play on. I think Newton, Winston, I think Gardner Minshew are three really good values in QBs. And I usually go your route too. I go late QB. Um, and, you know, when I say like you have to react, I don't mean like you have to react in the second or third round. I'm saying like in the fifth or sixth, once like that 15th, like 20th quarterback is going off, that's when you have to start reacting, right? Because if you don't react then, you're literally looking at like, you know, a freaking like Tom Brady plus, you know, Mitch Trubisky quarterback lineup. And let me tell you, that does not work. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't work I one bit. Try. Um, yeah, I mean, even if Trubisky starts, that doesn't work. So. That, yeah, we also got Trubisky well. here because we don't know why, but if he somehow beats out Nick Foles, then guess what? We have five starting quarterbacks. And yeah, it, it's ugly now, but it might work. Um, and I'll also say, I think after the top seven quarterbacks, Mike, I know you're a little bit lower on Josh Allen. It might extend to eight for you to include Wentz. But after those guys, like the difference between like a Baker Mayfield and a Kirk Cousins, sure, it might be like one or two points a game difference. But the, the discount you can get, like a Baker Mayfield in the third versus a Cousins in the sixth, just like at that yeah. point, I would wait and try to get value because in between those rounds, you can get like a DK Metcalf, like Keenan Allen, a Julio Jones. So uh, that's where I'm at with quarterbacks. Mike, as for running backs, how do you feel about just, if you don't get like the top couple guys just fading the position? Because this is another thing that I do. And in this draft, we kind of did that as well. We took uh, Joe Mixon at the 203 and we didn't draft another running back until the 12th round. But what we did do is draft the rookie 105 and 106 to kind of pick up a J.K. Dobbins and Akers, a Clyde edwards alaire If they do fall, Yannick, I'm sorry for giving too much away about our draft strategy, <laughs> but I think at this point it's kind of known. So how do you feel about just fading guys after like that Nick Chubb and uh, Joe Mixon tier, unless they fall out of value, of course? Yeah, well, I mean, you saw me. Like, I only have one running back as well. I only have Miles Sanders. And, you know, so Miles Sanders is someone that I'm actually 
really starting to like more and more as I move forward. But I totally agree with you. Like fading the mid round of running backs is like my go-to strategy. That's why I go running back Kevin in the beginning, right? Like I get a couple of studs, but I'm not using draft capital on guys like, you know, Singletary, the Marlon Max, Aaron Jones, the Fournette, the, even Aaron Jones and Drake, who I really like, right? Because this is before the draft, right? There's nothing that slams a running back value more than when a team drafts another running back and you don't know what teams are going to do. So I, I like to, if I'm drafting before a draft, I'm drafting players that hold value or have a good shot of increasing. So like risky quarterbacks, if they land a job, boom, an immediate value increase. Wide receivers typically hold, even if they draft someone, because there's more than enough targets to go around. Quarterbacks, starting quarterbacks, like they basically don't lose their jobs, right? So whereas running backs, like if they draft someone, it is it is a virtual lock for value to decrease, even if like they're not that good. It's just going, it's just like an opportunity play, right? You can't get all the pie if someone else is there. So that, I kind of faded as well. I'm pretty similar to you guys on that front. Yeah, and even like a Devin Singletary you brought up, even if they don't bring in anybody through the draft, how much higher of a value can he go than what, like a fifth fifth round startup, like maybe a fourth? If they do draft a guy, even if it's like a Zach Moss or an Eno Benjamin, what does he bump down to, like a seventh, eighth round because they're afraid of the competition that's there? And we saw him already in a time split with 45-year-old Frank Gore. So I think the risk-reward isn't worth taking him. And if they do draft a running back, maybe that opens up an opportunity to buy him because you believe in the talent more than the other guy that they draft. So yeah, I'm completely on board with you. It worked for me in one league last year where I chose Austin Eckler in like the 13th round. So that that paid off big time. Maybe Tony Pollard is that guy this year, but we'll have to wait and see on that. And I think- Dude, it's, re- it's really fun when you do those drafts. Like I did that last year too. I didn't draft my first running back till the 12th round. It took like Matt Breida. But I also knew that, like, I, I started with, like, Juju Smith-Schuster, and I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this as, like, a productive struggle from year one and just accumulate as many draft picks as I can. And, like, now in year two, I have, like, four or five top five picks, and I'm, I flip one for Mixon. I'll probably try and flip some for Vets. And, like, I basically go from, like, bottom of the league to, like, top of the league within one year. And it's really fun when you draft like that because you have zero consideration for, like, for team needs. I'm just like, I don't even care. I'm just going to pick whoever I think is the best and just like let it build from there that's why dynasty is the best because you can just have one strategy one year completely flip the script become a competitor the next year with a completely new roster so that's why that's our pitch on dynasty a little five second elevator pitch you're going from floor one to floor two that's why you're playing dynasty fantasy football (laughs) as for tight ends we kind of touched on this in a video within itself so we'll just be brief i think mike and i agree like after kittle kelsey mark andrews maybe extended to Ertz and waller there aren't many other tight ends I'm willing to reach on, even in tight end premium, because when it comes down to it, tight end premium just gives you extra points for receptions. And as much as you may love a guy like Hunter Henry or uh, Noah Fant, like what are the chances that they catch 70, 80 balls? I know Noah Fant doesn't have much competition this year, but if they add somebody through the draft, I'm not so sure the volume is there. So the uptick in volume that they may see, doesn't, it doesn't warrant them moving up you know, two, three rounds from a regular draft because you're only getting half an extra point for those receptions. And if they catch 60 balls that year, that's 90 points in a 1.5 PPR league or whatever. And a guy like Robert Woods, five five rounds later, is going to get you the same amount of points off of his receptions alone. Obviously going to have more yards and probably similar touchdowns. So yeah, after the first, you know, four or five tight ends, I'm kind of just off reaching on them. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I looked at this before, like what tight end premium really does is it makes really good tight ends really good and then increases the gap of everything else in the middle. So if you're like reaching on a middling tight ends, like it's just like not a great strategy. I actually landed Noah Fant in the filet public because he felt like the seventh, which is like literally the latest I've ever seen him go this year. And I, I like him. And uh, just given where my team is going, like I don't think I'm competing year one. So I, I'm happy to hold on stuff that I think can like really go up in value in the future. But yeah, generally speaking, like don't reach for the middling tight ends. It's not worth it. But I would say Waller and I would say Ingram the key question mark there is obviously if he's healthy, but if Ingram's healthy, he's kind of very much in that elite tier of scoring you like top five wide receiver scoring. And I think our league actually did a very good job, at least in my opinion, of waiting on tight ends. Like mm-hmm. we personally, we chose Austin Hooper at the 803 and neither of us were a huge fan on him, but in the eighth round, a guy that may catch like, you know, 70 balls for 700 yards and five touchdowns may not sound great, but in a tight end premium league, that's like over a hundred points just straight off of catches. Tyler Higby, you got late in the seventh. We wanted him very badly. At least I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that was a huge value, but that was right after the Cooks news. So I think you would have probably waited a little bit more if the Cooks news hasn't emerged because it looks like they're going to be running a, a ton of two tight end sets. Go to, no, I was actually copping them no matter what. No matter what. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's yeah. a smart move. Because yeah. Brandon Cooks, although I said he's the best receiver in the league, <laughs> in fact, not the best receiver in the league and not very good. Um, yeah, and a bunch of guys actually fell. So 
I think that's it for just an overview of regular draft strategy. Now we can jump into some of the trades that went down in our league. So you can see an actual realistic trade that you can pull off. And then Mike and I will dive into two more in-depth trades where we did like five trades that stemmed from one. And then we got a ton of value because of it. So um, actually the first trade in our league came from Mike. He gave up the 105 for the 301, the 412, the 701, and a 2021 first. So just by looking at it and hearing those numbers, you're like, that's a huge value. Then you look at the players it turned into, and Mike didn't end up picking all these guys on his side because he ended up trading them, but it's kind of hard to track all this stuff. So the trade ended up being Michael Thomas for the rookie 104, which is either a top two quarterback, a top two running back, Miles Sanders, and Tyler Higby in a tight end premium league. Give me, give me that side. Like, I don't think it's, <laughs> it's a complete blowout, but I think yeah. it is good enough that you get a rookie one. Actually, I forgot something. Oh, yeah. And the 2021 first on top. So, yeah. When I see that, yeah, just give me that side. Because you're getting probably two top 12 running backs with Miles Sanders and yeah. the rookie or a top 12 quarterback. And then you also get Tyler Higby. I mean, there's just a ton of value moving back. Yeah, I think, you know, with that trade, it's it's actually fair, I think, when you when you look at it in a vacuum. But when you think about building team depth like mm -hmm. how and roster construction, again, like value-wise, it's fine. But, like, if you want to think about how to build your team and how to build like the most strong and sustainable team for the future, like I'm always going to take more players because you're looking at, even if like the 104 bus, right. I'm looking at like two to three starters in place of one. And that's mm -hmm. like a really important thing, especially when you have leagues. Now, I think this one's is a what start nine league, right? Uh, I think it's start nine or 10, something like that. Yeah. So I play in other leagues that are like start 10, start 11. And when you have like that much, like it's a lot of points to give up for one player. So I love MT. I think he's a total stud, but you know, I just, I just love trading back because it gives me more starters. And then the other thing that like people don't think about is like as good as MT is, as good as CMC is, as good as Barkley is, they're already at the top, right? Like where are they going to go? Like they have no can't to... go, You can't get better than the one one Like there's no yeah. one zero zero. Yeah. And like, if you think about all the like trade calculators, shout out to Alex Munn's trade calculator fiend. The God. Uh, but yeah, the God. I just backed but, out of this video listening to it. Yeah. But if you think about like trade calculators, right, they benchmark to like the top, right? So it's not like the roof is continually going up. It's like whoever the best player is, is going to get assigned a value and everyone else kind of cascades down from that. So you don't really have much upside for MT, but like with all these little picks like Sanders, Higby, rookie 104 and the 2021 first, like they all have the chance to appreciate in value for you to win down the road. So when I do trades, like I always, almost always open with like close to my best trade as possible uh, with the mindset that like I'm making bets and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but if they do work, my assets will appreciate down the road. So I try, I look to win trades down the road, not like right now. Yeah. And another trade that might sit, fall into that similar vein is the 106 for the 112, the 912, the 1112, and a 2021 fourth round pick. So I think that fourth round pick, we can just kind of like throw away. It was probably just yeah. like an add on into it. But this case, I don't think trading up is too terrible because you get it turned into Ezekiel Elliott for Tyreek, the rookie 202, and Tony Pollard. Now, Tony Pollard is tied to Zeke being healthy or not, or just sucking or not. I wouldn't be willing to bet that Zeke just falls off completely off the map this year. So not that that's a waste of a pick. It's more of a long-term play. But I think in just looking at it from the outside in, I don't think it's bad to trade up in that type of scenario because you get a top running back for what we just said. Like, we like to wait on receiver. Sure, Tyreek Hill is a top two or three dynasty receiver, but I would much rather Ezekiel Elliott, who you know week in, week out, is giving you top five numbers. The rookie 202, that is nice in a super flex league, but that's probably going to turn into like a T. Higgins or a Henry Ruggs who have a 50-50 shot of busting and like an 80-20 shot. Whoa, 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 whoa. Titty Higgins has a 100% shot of balling out. So I don't know. Yeah, but Henry Ruggs has zero. So I had to the averages. So, and then like an 80-20 shot of them not even making your roster in year one, maybe not even year two. So I don't think that's a bad trade to move up. If the value is there, like we said earlier, just like sometimes just pull the trigger and get yourself a stud like Ezekiel Elliott. Um, Actually, hold on. Before we move on, like I think I think that's a trade where like I would I would not do. Like it, this is a, this is an example where like you take trading back too far to me. Mm -hmm. I think like because you're looking at what is that twelfth twelfth round picks, right? Is that that uh, a ninth, right? a, like a late nine, a late twelve, and a twenty twenty one first? Yeah, I mean I think it's fair, but like that that's like not really enough for me to like really get excited because you're. I don't know. It's it's a little bit risky. And like Tony Pollard, like I look, I love Tony Pollard, but he's a backup running back, right? So like not only does he have to beat out Zeke, people forget there's a draft every single year. So he has to beat out Zeke, then he has to beat out the next draft class. So there's like a, a lot for him to climb, right? Mm -hmm. So so when you're looking at guys like that, like I'd much rather just lock down a workhorse running back. 
Yeah, I'm 100% on board with that. The next one also on paper doesn't look great, but when you look at the numbers, it gets much more fair. So Scott traded the 101, which was Patrick Mahomes, for the 309, the 404, and the 509. Now, Scott definitely did not make any of these picks because he probably traded these picks 100 times over, and he wanted to tell me that because, you know, I'm not going to out Scott and say that he made this trade, and he got Juju, Daniel Jones, and Waller for it. Different people. I think you actually got Waller and Daniel Jones. I got Waller and Daniel Jones. I traded up with Scott to get him. But even then, like, you get a fringe top 12 quarterback, a top five tight end, and a top 10 dynasty wide receiver for Patrick Mahomes, and Patrick Mahomes is great. But just getting that depth on a, in a league where you start nine or 10 guys, I think is huge. Now, I don't know, in a vacuum on a trade calculator, they probably prefer the Mahomes side. But for me personally, I like the depth there, and especially what Scott did thereafter, probably adding like three sixes, three sevens, and eight, like a firstborn child, like anything he can get his hands on. Uh, Scott probably ended up winning the trade. Um, but just even this, right, if he had kept these picks and made those selections, I think I like the package more, even though you're giving up possibly the best player in Dynasty. No, I like the package more. And I, I'd actually wager that the, the TC is probably like that package more as well. Um, Maybe, yeah. if, I, if I'm just looking at those values, I think Juju's around like, if I look at DTC, Juju's probably around like a 30. Daniel Jones probably around like a 26. Waller and a tight end premium is probably around like, you know, 17 to 20. So you're looking at like, uh, what is that? Like almost like it, near like 70, 80 points of value. I think Mahomes is like 60. So TC's probably winning that side too. TC's won again. <laughs> the next <laughs> trade. This is actually one that Yannick and I made. We gave up the 501 or the 510. I'm not so sure. Uh, one of those two for the 60. Yeah, it was the 510. The 510 for the 604 and the 804. I think just looking at the numbers, you could see which side you prefer. Prefer, but then putting names to it, it ended up being Evan Ingram for Stefan Diggs in the rookie 109. I wrote it down incorrectly, but um, obviously I'm gonna like the side of the trade that I got. Mike, how about an unbiased third party view of this? Dude, I I love that trade. I mean, anytime you can just move back one round, it looks like what this 13 spots um and you acquire another pick in the eighth again it just goes back to like depth and that rookie 108 like i bet when you're on the clock you're gonna be able to flip that for if you don't make the pick you'll probably flip that for like you could probably flip that for like a robert woods right like it's another, in the woods like, Ingram, i'll take that any day immediate starting wide receiver so i love that pick. i love that uh trade as well yeah and the last straight up one that we did actually is my team as well the 209 and the 1205 and we gave up the 406 and the 707 we did need a quarterback at this point. So we ended up getting Josh Allen and then T.Y. Hilton went at the 12.05. And the picks that we gave up turned into Cortland Sutton and T.J. Hawkinson, two guys that I'm very high on. But anytime you can net yourself a top seven or eight dynasty quarterback for a wide receiver, which we know is super deep, and a middling tight end, I'm going to push the button any, any day of the week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and Hawk, to be honest, like fell a little bit farther than uh, normal. So they kind of got great value on that pick. I think if we look at like other guys in that range, it looks like much better, right? Like Hawkinson went in there. So you got like Michael Gallup's, the Tyler Boyd's, the Tom Brady. Melvin actually, Gordon, that yeah. That pick's whack, Melvin Gordon. So yeah, I definitely like like your side as well. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of Josh Allen, but the hype is pretty big. So even if you guys wanted to sell him and uh, maybe sell him back to Richie for two times what you bought it at, which seems, oh, to, no. be the, seems to be the way to do it, um, you can definitely do that as well. Yeah, love you, Richie. Mike, how do you jump into your cascade effect of trading the number one pick or a first round pick in one of your other leagues? Yeah, so I, I, if you guys saw it, um, I put out a tweet a couple of days ago, super late at night, so you might not have seen it, but I'm in this uh, thing called DLF Champions Dynasty League. So it's like a 12 team PPR, super flex, 1.5 tight end premium with like an empire pot where like it accumulates over three years and it's based on a bunch of different scoring uh accumulations but basically like whoever does the best in those three years wins uh that big pot and i implemented a trade down strategy and this is probably one of the best ones that i've done and we'll throw up the graphic for you that like shows all the trades i did but i just want to really highlight like one really important concept and that's like the cascading effect of trading down right so what i did is i took my first round pick which is a 1.03 so one of those studs i think it turned out to be lamar jackson and I traded it for the 209, the 504, and the 704. So pretty fair trade, right? If you actually want to move up to something that big. But then what I did was I took the 209 and I flipped that for a fourth, a fifth, and a 2021 20, second, right? And then I basically took a, a full cascading effect. I later, I later traded down those picks even more. And what ended up happening was I basically gave up a, my first, my 1.03, a fifth round pick. And I got a third round startup, a fifth round startup a sixth round startup, two seventh round startups, a ninth round startup, a 2021 first and a 2021 second. So just a huge cascading effect, right? Now, if I attach player names to that, what ended up happening was I gave 
Lamar Jackson, and Jerry Judy. And I received Jonathan Taylor, Evan Ingram. This is a two PPR uh, tight end premium. DJ Chark, Ryan Tannehill, Todd Gurley. I actually clocked out on that pick because I was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so that pick. never choose Todd Gurley. <laughs> yeah, I would never choose Todd Gurley. I could have got Stephon Diggs there. So like, imagine Stephon Diggs there. Gardner Minshew, 2021 first and 2021 second. I don't think I need to tell you, give you a TC to tell you which side was the winner on that one. And like in the original trade, it was pretty even. But obviously by the end, after I netted everything out, it was a pretty big W for me. Yeah. And Yannick and I actually did a similar type of thing in the Filet the Public League. And Mike, just touching on what you did, that is a masterclass of trading. You can like write a book and put it on a coffee table and everybody's just going to get smarter by reading that thing. But for us, what we did was, it was kind of strange, right? Because we wanted to move back. So we traded our 110, our 910, and a future second round pick, next year's second round pick for the 308, the 405, and a 2021 first. But then somebody had offered us the 201, an 801, and a 2021 second for a third and a fourth. So we basically just reversed the trade, got our second round pick back, <laughs> moved from the 110 to the 201, and moved up from the 910 to the 801. And as we all know, like the difference between a 110 and a 201 isn't great. So we basically just got a ton of value there. Then we traded a 909 that we got some other point. I forgot where it was for a 2021 second, third, and fourth, which whatever. Or no, we got a 301, a 1301. And we traded the 308 and the 1003 we'd gotten previously. Then we got a 1306, a 606 for a nine and a 2021 first that we had gotten through the first trade. And then we got a 911 for the 1301 and the 1204. All those numbers, you probably don't know what the hell just happened. It ended up being the, we got the 201, the 301, the 606, the 801, the 911, and the 1307 for the 110, the 310, a late ninth, a 10th, a 12th, and a 2021 second, third, and fourth. Putting names to that, we ended up hauling in Chris Godwin, Mark Andrews, and the tight end premium league, the rookie 106, the rookie 109, Cam Newton, and James White for Dalvin Cook, DJ Moore, Le'Veon Bell, Mark Ingram, and the rookie 202. So just... (laughs) <laughs> I'll put up pictures of this so you can just like follow along and see how we ended yeah. up making those trades. But if you don't map it out that way, you may think each individual trade might have either been a push or a loss. But when you really see what happened, the cascade effect of trading back and just making more value out of one pick or two picks, uh, you get a ton in return. And that's just the beauty of a startup draft that you can really finagle your league. You can make a bunch of trades and work around it. If you have Richie in your league, we love you, man, but it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, and you get you get a ton of value, right? And you, you get to turn a Dalvin Cook into wide receiver one, a tight end one. And sure, you have to give back a few later picks. But, you know, we want depth and we want quality depth. And that's exactly what you can get by making these type of moves. Yeah, a couple other concepts that I think, you know, people don't really understand. There is no cheaper time to buy rookie picks than in the startup draft. And I think Bailey in our league did a really good job of this, by the way. Uh, shout out to him. I'm pretty sure he got coached by Danny. Um, But I think like, because the reason why is because people think that moving up makes your team stronger. Unless you're in a start seven, start eight type of team, it doesn't because you're like literally one injury away from fucked, right? Imagine like, uh, and this happened uh, because if you look at like Dalvin Cook, right? He's a first round pick uh, last year, but then he got hurt. So then you're like out of the playoffs. So when people are selling their rookie picks to move up, they're like, in their mind, they're like, oh, this is a stud. It makes my team stronger, therefore devalues my rookie picks. In my experience, I think those people are the ones you want to target because they're actually devaluing the rookie picks. Because in that off, they don't, they don't properly account for like the risk-adjusted reward. Because in the event that your stud goes down to injury, which happens every single year, you're looking at like a top three, four pick, right? Like imagine trading down from like the third to the sixth and adding their first and they, they get an injury and you're looking at a DeAndre Swift. You got a DeAndre Swift to move from the third to the sixth, right? Those are the, those are the types of moves that you really want to do. Like how do you guys think about rookie pick values in the startup? Yeah, I think you did it really well as well because you traded with Alex in our league and I don't think he had his roster filled until the 12th or 13th round. You got his first round pick by giving him, was it the Michael Thomas lot? If yeah. Michael Thomas, God forbid, gets injured next year, and he is left with, you know, the guys that he picked in the fourth, fifth, sixth round, not much depth, nothing to put in the flex spot, nobody that is comparable to Michael Thomas at all off his bench. You get his rookie pick. Sure, his lineup may look like stacked right now because he has nine really good guys, but the 10th guy, the 11th guy, putting them in his roster isn't going to help him win games. That rookie pick that you get as just a throw-in, as a little bit of extra value, might be the 104, the 105 next year, which is like 
a Rashad Bateman, a, a Jamar Chase, what you name it. Like it's it's a ton of value. Then you can use that trade next year to get a stud because as we see this year, these rookie picks as the draft gets closer <laughs> and closer, as the combine happens, as these guys run four threes and look jacked as hell with their shirt off, people <laughs> want them. And then you can trade them for studs and you can trade that 103 for like a, an AJ Brown who may be starting to break out even more the year after. So yeah, uh, just adding those two packages and Yannick and I actually traded for the 2021 firsts and then we used it to leverage to move up a little bit we gave Alex yeah, I, dude, think, dude, I couldn't believe you guys gave up Jonathan John John my boy did we I love John dude I love you man but uh, I could not believe you guys gave up his first that's like an auto lock for the 102 you think so man John I'll be here for you man we're, we're both <laughs> tall we got to stick together no, John, no I'm kidding. He, his, team, his, team's good. his team's good his team's good John you will be the 112 because I don't want that pick to end up helping <laughs> uh, Bailey at all but yeah um, definitely stockpile uh, 2021 first seconds. I'm like, eh, because if it's the 212, it's, it's going to be garbage. And you can't really tell who's going to be the 201 a year from now. So yeah, yeah, first round picks hold a lot of value because especially if you're not in win now mode, why not just load up on things on assets that are going to grow much for much higher than literally anything else in the startup draft. Yeah. On the seconds though, I will say one strategy that I've implemented in a couple leagues is in the early rounds, in the early first, if I wasn't able to trade fully out of the round, I would move back a couple of slots and I would get like a second round pick. I'd move back a couple of slots, get a second round pick and a swap later. And what happened was I accumulated like so many second round picks in the early rounds and you could either use them to move up later uh, because you can move from like the eighth to the seventh or something with the second round pick. Or what I did is I would do other swaps where I would say, okay, I'll give you my fifth round pick uh, and I'll move back to your seventh or eighth round pick and I'll give you a rookie second, and you give me your rookie first. And that's how I basically manufactured a bunch of rookie first and owned the entire first round. And it turned out that, like, their team sucked, and eventually I owned half the round. But I think that's another place where, like, seconds come in value. Uh, like, if you think about drafting the player, it's not that valuable, but it gives you another anchor and another asset to, like, trade and swap. Yeah, and just looking at our draft board, if you traded a late second for a mid-third and a rookie pick, you trade away DeAndre Hopkins for Amari Cooper and a second round pick next year that, you, as you said, you could attach to a deal that gains more value heading into next year. So yeah, that's a huge strategy. I think that really just wraps up this entire video. We're going to head into the narrative now. Oh, one more we, thing. Sorry, okay. one more thing before we move on. Uh, the last concept I want to cover is just like owning a round. So what I mean by that is, you know, typically in a startup snake, snake draft, there's anywhere between 12 and like 24 picks for, for between your picks, right? Depending on your picking from the front, middle or the end. What happens when you trade down is you get multiple picks in the same round. And like, if you're, if you only have one pick in the round, if you trade back, it's, it's a really hard mental like barrier for people to overcome. They're like, Oh, I'm going to miss on like the next 12 to 20 tier of guys. Right. But if you have two guys, if you have two picks in that round, you're like four or five picks or like seven, eight picks apart. It's less risky for you to trade back and it allows you to capitalize on more trade back opportunities. So that's a, like, that's like a pretty underrated, concept that i don't think many people talk about but like having close picks in the draft really allows you to navigate and move the draft like much better than if you just had like one pick yeah scott is very good at doing that and we try to do that a few times at like the end of the eighth into the ninth at that turn but yeah it gets you a lot of value it allows you to control what you want to control and if there are a bunch of guys that you like then you can move back those picks and accumulate more later picks and then just move from like the 801 say to the 807 when you have the 804 805 806 so you're still in a row and you can dominate that draft that way so yeah that is another good strategy. It may, it's maybe a little bit harder to pull off because, you know, some people in that row might not want to trade with you because they see your name is Scott Cano and <laughs> they know you're coming for their head. But yeah, that's another really good uh, strategy to employ. Uh, I think we're going to head into the narrative now and we're going to talk about the beauty of trade calculators. <laughs> This week's narrative, trade calculators are trash and overvalued. I have my view on this. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about it, Noah? Uh, my main issue with trade calculators, especially during the startup draft, is they don't always take into account the value that falls, right? You might put in like a, a six-round startup pick, and they could be assigning like a Debo Samuel to that pick or like a Noah Fant. They don't really know, right? They go off of based off of their own rankings, but they don't know what happens in the previous rounds. Maybe there was a quarterback run and an uh, and Allen Robinson falls to the sixth round. Maybe a Cooper Cup falls to the sixth round. Maybe a tight end run happened and good running backs, like maybe a Devin Singletary falls to that round. So I don't think it really takes into account the value that falls. I think if you're going to use it, you have to attach a name to it instead of a pick because at that point you get to see the true value in the trade rather than just an arbitrary number where it could be one of like five different players when that's not even who you're trying to target there. 
Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, one of the most popular trade calculators like uh, DTC or DLF and you can actually plug in startup values and they'll split it out. But it's like, it's like you said, right? Like all it does is take their ranks and assign values to it. So I'll give you a perfect example in the filet of the public, Deshaun Watson fell to the 2.8, right? And I put the 2.8 on the block. I said, Hey, anyone interested? And our boy, you know, came in with the TCs and said, look, this value is like really good for you. I'm like, listen, I don't give a fuck what your TC says. Deshaun I, Watson. Desha- <laughs> I was like, I know Deshaun Watson's on the board and I know DeAndre Hopkins on the board. So take that and plug it in your t- t- trade calculator and tell me what it says. It doesn't take into account teardrops and it doesn't take into account the flow of the draft, which is why it's like, it's completely overrated. And whenever someone comes to me and says like the TC says this, I say, I don't give a fuck what your TC says. This is what I want. If you don't want to pay it, fine, move on. Because it just doesn't take into account those factors. What I will say is I do think it's useful to understand especially in leagues like ours where you have guys that like live and die by the trade calculator because you kind of like get some insight into what they think and you can construct trades that you think are beneficial to you, but work in their favor. And, you know, one of, you know, for example, last year I knew guys in my leagues using trade calculators and this was before the season started. And I thought DJ Moore was incredibly undervalued. So I would go into trade calculator. I would plug in players that on my, on my, on my team that I didn't like really like long-term guys like Chris Carson, guys like Marlon Mack. So I took Chris Carson, Marlon Mack, and I traded it for DJ Moore and a future and Matt Breida, I think. And Oof, at the time, yeah. at the time it was like a it was like a 40 point for them and like 30 point for me, but in my mind I'm like I don't give a shit because I know Chris Carson and Marlon Mack are going down. So I think there's value to understanding it, but definitely don't live by it uh in terms of like your own trades. Like it's kind of like it's like any other tool. It's like ADP, right? If you understand ADP, and you understand the difference between ADP and your ranks, you can take advantage. If you understand the difference between TC and your values, you can take advantage. So that's how I view it. Yeah, and if it also doesn't take into account your team needs and the situation that you're in, right? So say you have Joe Mixon and Jonathan Taylor, and then your wide receivers are, we'll name the other guys we named early in the video, a Devontae Adams, a, uh, an Adam Thielen, a Robert Woods, and let's say a Jarvis Landry. And you get a trade for Tyreek Hill for jo- uh, Joe Mixon right? You may think because on the calculator, Tyreek Hill is 45 points and Joe Mixon is 37. You should accept it. Well, then you're left with no RB2 and you're left with five startable wide receivers. Obviously, Tyreek Hill is better than the rest of them, but what is your team going to look like on a week-to-week basis, right? Even during startup drafts, you see how your team starts to shape out and it might look like a value because you're getting a better player, but there's a reason why you pick the players that you picked and there's a reason why you had this strategy that you you deploy throughout the draft. If you start to stray away from that and you see more holes because of that, just because you're trying to follow, follow a trade calculator, you know, trade by trade, and you don't really see how your team is shaking up because of it. uh, It can put you in a pretty deep hole because you start to give up, you know, team needs just to get value when, you know, you may be able to, you can think to yourself, Oh, I can trade Tyreek Hill later for another running back. But what if somebody doesn't want Tyreek Hill? What if, you know, Tyreek Hill, this is kind of his own type of example, but what if something else happens off the field with him and he loses a ton more value? Like, Uh, I would just, I would say, look at your team, maybe use a trade calculator just to see what a player's value is if you aren't completely sure on it relative to other guys, but definitely don't live and die by it. Making your team better is way more important than winning a trade. Like people love winning trades. Like I I don't give two fucks about winning a trade. I'm always thinking about winning a trade down the road because I'm making on bets on players that I like. But if I lose a trade in the moment, but it makes my team better, great. I will accept it every single time. I'm not looking to like trade rape for everyone. Because like you basically like people will stop trading with you if that happens. So just like offer offer good trades, man. Just don't just don't go in like lowballing everyone with like shit trades because you're not gonna get it done. So it's very important because at the end of the day, the best teams win, right? It's not it's not a champion of who makes who wins the most trades, right? It's a championship that's won by scoring the most points. So I literally could not care less about winning trades most of the time. I understand, agree. And I think that wraps up this long, long video about startup advice, not following your calculator, getting into a league through our Dynasty Discord. We have leagues up and running all the time. I actually have to reach out to Discord and see what they did because now we can't see people that are offline, so I can't see who's filled. So if your league isn't filling right now, be assured I'm on it. I'm trying to fix that. And your league should be up and running very, very soon. Draft is around the corner. Uh, good things are ahead, Mike. Things yep. We're not just in this in this drought with nothing happening for two months the draft is like a week away and we're going to be hitting you with some hypotheticals different landing spots maybe next week uh, players that we might want to see in different areas and how that could impact their fantasy value and then the following week we're just going to have a very long show breaking down basically every single move that happened in the draft so 
get ready. Good things are ahead despite everything else that's shitty going on in the world. So uh, keep your head high and more Dynasty content will be on.